I want you to, as we read together in Luke chapter 19, I want you to understand the story that is happening here is something that you possibly, if you've been in church any amount of time, you have read this story before. You have read it and you've probably even sang songs that go along with it. But I promise you, there's more than just what you were taught to sing in a song that's going to be transformational to each one of our lives today. At the end of this passage, Jesus says in Luke chapter 19, in the story of what's taking place in the life of this man, some people are questioning him. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, you got to ask yourself the question, why did Jesus come to this earth? Why did he come? Well, he told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 why he came. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life and will not perish. But the next verse says that he came what? He, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So if you can imagine with me why this is such a frustration to people that are surrounding this moment to the things that Jesus has been doing, they're frustrated because the religious people, and I want you to understand that re the religious people had the answer, but they were missing the answer that God had given. And they were so driven to be right that they had become experts at spotting what was wrong with everyone else. And you're going to see that Zacchaeus was an issue for them because he was a reject of his people because they were rejecting him because he was a traitor to them. Like, oh, he's just a tax collector. Well, you got to know what a tax collector is. I will say this as well. I'm never surprised whenever lost people do lost things. Like, I'm never, why would I ever be offended when someone doesn't know Jesus that does something that doesn't honor Jesus? Oh, my gosh, I can't believe they're not honoring the Lord with their life. Well, they don't know him. And it's hard to honor somebody you don't know. But when you meet him, it changes you. When he comes to your place and lives in your house, it changes you. So I never get confused when lost people do lost things. The only thing that ever confuses me is whenever saved people do lost things. It brings confusion. And so here Jesus is. He is answering the question of who that is. Jesus was on a mission for that, to seek and to save that which was lost. And so you look back at the beginning of the story in Luke chapter 19, it says that Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. This is not where Jesus resided. This is not his base camp. This is not his home location. He's passing through Jericho, and it says there was a man there by the name of Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, if you read that, you'll go right past it and not understand the significance of what it is. See, Zacchaeus is a Jewish man working for the Roman government. And the Jewish people despised the Roman government because they had taken control and they were dishonoring to the Lord. I mean, the Roman government was a corrupt government. There's no doubt about it. So corrupt, their civilization became, became uh, it, it's no longer because of the corruptness and the perversion of it. And they've taken control of the Jewish communities, all the communities, and they are absolutely having their way. And so this Jewish man raised in a Jewish home bows the knee to a Roman government and misrepresents his people to take advantage of them. Do you know, how many of you know that'll make you mad? It'll make you frustrated. It'll make you mad. These people despise him. Just the same way they despise Matthew, who was one of Jesus's 12. He knew, listen to me, the thing you got to know about Zacchaeus is Zacchaeus was raised the right way. He knew the law. He knew the shaman. He knew who God was, Jehovah. But because he had looked and something had caught his eye, he was willing to compromise everything he was taught to become a tax collector. And becoming a tax collector meant you would upcharge the people for your own benefit. And he's upcharging these. He's stealing from his own people. How many of you know they weren't very welcoming of him? They despise him. So when you see that Zacchaeus is a tax collector and a wealthy man, it's not like he's walking through the community. It's like, oh, Zacchaeus, come hang out with us. He is as much of a reject in their society. He doesn't fit in with the Romans and he doesn't fit in with the, with the Jewish people. He's an outcast of his society, but he's got money and he's got things. 
What is it that would ever make him do this? How would he bow the knee to a government that he knows is dishonoring to the one he's supposed to worship? How is, because he's made up his mind, I'm not going to be broke. Let me tell you what he was. Zacchaeus was a sellout to his God and to his people. But I know people that sell out all the time. Judas sold out for 30 pieces of silver. There are people that sell out for all kinds of different reasons. They sell out not because it's their first intention. It's because they seek to go, get along to, to, to go along to get along more than they do to stand for what they know is right. They do it for happiness, which we talked about several, several weeks ago, that happiness is not the main concern of your life when it comes to Christ. Because the Lord wants to give you joy, and joy is more than a feeling. Joy is a person named Jesus. See, Zacchaeus had money. He had buy-in from endorsement from the Romans, but to his people, he was a traitor. And he had all he needed to be happy in the standards of what the Roman government thought. I mean, you ought to just be happy we let you do this. But his people despised him of it. Now, this man that had all of what the world would say he needed, he had, he had position and he had wealth, still wanted to see Jesus. How do I know this? Because the next verse says so. He says he wanted to see who Jesus was. Now, can you imagine this man who seemingly has everything that he thinks he needs, all of a sudden wants to see the next big thing coming to town, passing through? Why did he want to see Jesus? Because it's possible that the word of the miracles that Jesus was performing and who he was performing miracles on. If you look back just a little earlier, you'll see that Jesus has cleansed a leper. Now, again, you could read through that like, oh, it's a crazy disease. But you have to understand what being a leper in biblical times really meant. It meant that you were considered physically unclean and contagious as well as spiritually unclean. So they basically just summed all of it up with this person is, they're an outsider, an outcast. It meant that they were completely shunned from normal activities of community life and banned from the inclusion and worship of the temple or in any synagogue, right? So they can't go worship. Let me tell you who else knows what that feels like, a tax collector, no one wants them around. He's shown the leper couldn't hold a job, couldn't live in a home with non-lepers, including their own family. Their own family couldn't. If someone got leprosy, their own family had no choice but to remove them, and they could not welcome them back. Couldn't shop in the market, couldn't own property, couldn't touch or hug, hold hands, nothing. The leper's only option was to beg for scraps from a distance in isolation and wait to, be, to deteriorate and die. Can I tell you that this rich man knew that feeling because even though he had the things that most people desired in this world, he had reached a place where he'd heard that a man named Jesus touched an outcast life. And he said, if he can touch an outcast like that, then who am I? And Jesus comes through his town. Can I tell you, I don't ever want you to discount the fact that Jesus will come through where you are. He says, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Now, I can make a ton of short jokes here, but I'm going to do that later. Verse 4 says, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Now, it's encouraging to me that Jesus sees him, even though it would have been easy to miss him because he's not that big of a guy. And he's not a popular guy. He's not someone everybody's going, hey, Jesus, here's this guy we love. He has a need. Please pay attention. This dude is despised by the crowd, despised by his own people. He's a reject of society. He sees him. And it says, so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Now, I'm sure this blessed everybody else. Oh, I'm so glad Jesus is talking to Zacchaeus. Look, can I tell you that there are times when we ask God to do something, we want him to do it the way we want him to do it, and, I, and he's like, I'm sorry, I'm not asking directions from you. <laughs> I'm not asking for your buy-in. 
Like, are you happy with what I'm doing? Are you happy I'm talking to Zacchaeus? That I'm going to go to his house? Like, how do you know everybody's happy, not happy? Because if you read the next verse, it says so. It says, all the people saw this and began to mutter. He is gone to be the guest of a sinner. Why? Because this is the reason Jesus came, to seek and to save that which was lost. Listen to me. If the church become experts to stay and save but never leading anybody into a relationship of salvation, then we will become inbred, and inbred brings dysfunction. When all you can do is spot what's wrong with everybody else instead of giving them an opportunity to meet Jesus, you'll complain whenever Jesus saves somebody you don't like. Now, in all fairness, I do want to say that when Jesus saves someone you don't like, doesn't mean they keep doing the things that cause them to be a reject. Well, how do I know that? Because it says in verse 8, that Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. Does that sound like a greedy man? No. And I have, if I have cheated anybody, if I have cheated, I love how he tried to church that up for the Lord. <laughs> Lord, if I've done anything... Dude is this criminal. <laughs> he was a thief, a con man. He's a tax collector. He's been stealing from it. If I've stolen, <laughs> cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back what I owe them. No, it doesn't say that. It says I'll pay back four times what I owe them. You know what that? It's like he'd learned that song that we just sang a little while ago. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. See, Zacchaeus at this moment wanted something different. So change was inevitable. How did change come to Zacchaeus' house? By changing the root so the fruit of his life would be different. So today I want to encourage each one of us that we must be willing to do whatever it takes to get to Jesus. And I'm going to say this. It's a strong statement, but I believe it with all of my heart. You are as close to Jesus as you want to be. You are as close to God as you want to be. Well, I just feel like when I talk to him, he does. Look, Jesus sees you. He sees you and he hears you. So don't let the enemy separate you. Because God sees you, he hears you. And God wants to come and get in your house. He wants to live in your house. He wants to take ownership of you. He wants to be your Lord and your Savior. And so you don't have to think, well, man, I don't think he can save somebody. If he can save somebody like Zacchaeus, he can save you and he can save me. Listen to me. There are moments in your life. I believe the lessons from the story of Zacchaeus are life transformational. Number one, he was willing to push through the crowd. Listen to me. He was a wee little man. You sang the song if you grew up in church. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Now, you can say that all you want to. We raised a short individual. I know what it's like for a short person to sit on a chair and them legs swing, to go to the movies and can't see the screen, who at the same time let pride rob us from good parking spots while she lived with us because she could have got a handicap sticker because she was only 4'9". And I think, or four, eight, whatever it is, she's a quarter of an inch from the height to not get a handicap. And she would not swallow her pride and give us an upfront spot. Just saying, she needed, she needed an opportunity. She loves it when I tell that joke. She will send me a text. She's probably, my phone's buzzing now. So there's, it's, but being short is not the issue. Being short is just an excuse that he could have used. Because of his physical stature, he wasn't going to let the crowd keep him from what he wanted to see. Listen to me. Your current situation doesn't hold you back. You hold yourself back. And the initial step may seem the hardest, but it's the steps that come after the first one that become difficult. You can see Jesus coming and you can take the first step and you can stop there, but you got to keep on stepping through the crowd because the crowd is placed there to distract you from your destiny. And even good intentioned people become a crowd to derail you from your destiny. Just because somebody's telling you something is right doesn't make it right unless the Bible says it's right. So you don't need it. Just because a crowd says it's popular or says it fits doesn't make it right. 
And the crowd around him would have prevented him from getting there because they don't even see the value in Zacchaeus. They see him as a reject of society. They see him as a traitor, as a sellout, as a con man. They see him as willing to do whatever it takes so he could have a better life, no matter how it affects anyone else. And now he has the opportunity to press through a crowd. Can you imagine pushing through? Like, I don't have an issue pushing through a crowd. I don't think it's rude to skip, but it's, but if I have to, if April gets separated from me, I'm not like, oh, girl, I'll catch you later. I'm like, that one was for me. I mean, I need to get separation anxiety. I'm finna, mm, no, I'm kidding. I'm not going to knock nobody down. I'm going to make my way through. But I could imagine if I was 65 pounds soaking wet, it'd be hard. If I was tired, they'd be like, it'd be easy to keep me out. Zacchaeus was not going to come up with an excuse of why he couldn't. In his current situation, he's, he's like, look, I'm taking this first step. And, and the crowd didn't just part the way. I'm like, oh, Zacchaeus wants to get to Jesus. Now, it seems like they should have made it easy for Zacchaeus to get to Jesus because they understood who Jesus really was. They'd have been like, please get this sorry tax collector and change his life. But they didn't. He had natural limitations meaning he could always find an excuse of why he couldn't get there. Can I tell you, the excuses are a terrible reason for you not to get what God has for you. I just, people like me don't have, okay. Can I tell you that the reason that I'm super grateful today is because I know people like me don't get to have families like mine. Because of a situation that happened in my teenage years and my parents, whether my mom was involved or not, she got caught up with it because of my dad's decisions and they were busted for drugs in 88. And in a small community that we were, it's very difficult to continue to play sports in a wrecked community where everybody knows what exactly was happening. And so they began to shun from those things. We moved to a town a little further away. Some of those people that were from that town moved to the area later in middle school and high school. I played football with them. And then one of them, I went to their family farm. I was a freshman going to sophomore year over the Christmas break coming back. And they dropped me off. And we didn't live in like the really good side of town like, because we weren't even zoned for the school I was going to or using someone else's address. I don't know why we did that. Um, I would have gladly went to the school we were zoned for, but they always, when I moved to the school zone that I was supposed to be, it's, the school I was going to, we ended up moving to that zone, and I went to a different school and used somebody's craziest thing, but that makes no sense, but that's what we did. And they dropped me off, and I remember that friend all of a sudden distancing himself, and he says, man, I'm so frustrated. My, my parents don't want me hanging out with you. I was like, why? Well, they said your parents weren't good people. They said they wanted me to befriend some people whose parents lived in. I was like, oh. Guys, I, I, that made no sense to me. That made zero sense to me. I was like, why, why would they take that out on me? I'm not a bad kid. And I have watched some of those individuals through life. After I met Christ, God transformed everything. And they got everything their parents wanted for them. And their life has crumbled. It's crazy that we would ever in society say, mm, you're not hanging out. Now, look, there's a, it is important. Who you run with can shape you. But pushing who you're running with to get them out of the way to get to Jesus is important. He pushed through a crowd and said, I'm not going to come up with an excuse to say, oh, well, people like me. Can I tell you, I know people like me don't get a chance to live unless it's Jesus, unless Jesus shows up. He pushes through the crowd, but that's not even the most defining part. The most defining part it, it, for the steps he took is that he climbed a tree. Tree climbing was not like a pastime in biblical times. So I'm like, oh, they're just climbing trees again. Oh, little tree climber Zacchaeus, there he is. You know, he's just a wee little man. So he does. He climbs trees all. That wasn't, that wasn't how it was. He was willing to say, hey, you know what? I'll push through the crowd, but I'll tell you even better than that. I'm going to get up here so I can clearly see him. Amen. There are times that you got to climb a tree so you can see him. He sees you, but you need to see him. You need to get to a place where you can see him clearly. You know what's so beautiful? As he climbs that tree, he's willing to do something different. He's learning that these are moments that define you. Can I tell you, you either define the moment or the moment will define you. You know how many, how many times in life I've regretted that I didn't climb a tree after I pushed through the crowd? 
and that moment passed me by and I became frustrated with myself, you, don't, you cannot imagine how many times Zacchaeus on the inside had regretted decisions he had made. And in this moment said, mm -mm, the crowd ain't going to hold me back and my shortness ain't going to hold me back. I'm going to climb this tree so I can see this man who touched a leper, who loves the unlovable, who forgives them and offers a new chance. I'm going to get to that man. He climbed that tree, was willing to do something different, and it changed his life. It was the one thing that he did that was different than the rest of the crowd trying to get close to Jesus. See, the one thing is something you'll hear me reference quite a bit through messages when I preach. One thing is a phrase that is important and central to the Christian life. Jesus told the righteous, the self-righteous rich young ruler in the gospel of Mark chapter 10, is like, hey, this one thing you lack. He explained to Martha when she criticized Mary, hey, look, this one thing is needed. The blind man who was given sight and said, look, all I know is this one thing. I was blind, but now I see. If you can get the one thing down, if you can get that one thing, the psalmist in Psalms 27 says, one thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after. See, too many times we want to do too many things, but really it's the one thing that defines us. And that one thing in his life that day was he climbed a tree to see clearly the son of God. Paul understood the one thing. He said, this one thing I do, I let go of what is behind and I push forward to what is ahead. And he wrote this in prison. Why? Not because things were great, because he was willing to do the one thing that got him above the rest of what his life was. He was willing to be different, do things different. He wasn't going to be like one living with no hope, no goal, no vision for the future, wandering through life with no aim, with misaimed passion. He said, the balance that I must understand is if I will do this one thing, as opposition comes against me, I can get above it. That's the one thing. I can get above the opposition. I can live past the opposition. Why? Because if I can see him clearly, he sees me clearly. And it's not that he couldn't see Zacchaeus. He knew exactly where Zacchaeus was, exactly what he was going through, and exactly what he was feeling. But he did not sit back and go, God, if you want to see me, you got to let me know. You know how many times we do, we're like, God, if you're real, make something fall right now. And then we get sued for it. Stop doing that. <laughs> or you go, God, if you really see me and where I'm at, let me know you. Can I tell you? He sees you. It's not about him seeing you. It's about you seeing him. You got to climb above that situation and see him. Like, well, how am I supposed to see him? It's not my tree to climb. It's your tree to climb. I'm climbing my trees. You got to climb your trees. I got plenty of crowd telling me I can't and the reasons I cannot. But when I get to the tree, I'm going to climb it in the name of Jesus because I need to see him. Because if I can see him, that means there's a chance he's going to come to my house. And if he comes to my house, it changes everything. So today I tell you, if you're not pressing forward, there's a good chance you're not climbing. And when you're not climbing, the attacks come and keep you drowned out in a place that you feel unbalanced. So I encourage you today, climb with every step that you take. You can find an excuse, but keep on climbing. Keep climbing to a place where you can see him clearly because there comes this moment where he looks up and says, hey, I'm coming to your house today. And when he shows up to your house, it changes everything. Now, this is the part that people forget because they stop at the fact that he said, I'm going to come to your house. But now Zacchaeus lives the difference because Jesus has come to his house. And the world is confused because those that said they've climbed a tree and met the Son of God don't live like they have met him. Now, you can take that however you want. If you go, oh, he's judging me. I'm not judging you because I don't even really know you. I'm not all up in your Kool-Aid trying to figure out. I'm not the Holy Spirit, and I have not been stalking your Facebook. And if you think I'm talking to you, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you, telling you to get your house in order. Put that in you, little. Never mind. It's, a, it's, like, a, it's like an opportunity that we have to be like, look, Jesus don't show up to your house and be like, I know it's all out of order, but who cares? 
He could, but grace says, I'm going to put it in order. And Zacchaeus said, hey, I'm going to give half everything I got to the poor. That's not what tax collectors do. Because you know what? He was willing to give up his livelihood to, to the, for the greatness of knowing God. Now, look, you may not have to give up your career, but Zacchaeus' career was dishonorable. Right? It would be like if I were a drug dealer and I met Jesus and be like, but I got to pay rent. I'm going to keep slanging this crack for the glory of God. That You can't do that for the glory of God. Like, well, that's judgment. No, because if he comes to my house, I'm not going to be an instrument to destroy other people. It changed him. How do you know? By the fruit that was produced of his life to say, I'll pay up to four times. That's crazy. Because it would have been decent enough for him to say, I mean, look, if somebody thinks I owe them, I'm going to pay them. See, the thing about a tax collector is he had a book of what he had done to everybody. So it wasn't like he had to sit around and wonder. He could go back and say, hey, can I tell you some of the most powerful things in your life is when you get above the crowd and you climb a tree and you see Jesus and he says, I'm coming to your house, is when you get a chance to make what you've wronged right. As a parent, do you know how powerful it is whenever you've done something and you've wronged one of your children unintentionally or maybe intentionally? Maybe you flipped, lost your lid, and you was going to let them know. You know, yeah, you know what it is. Like, you know, they teach a dolphin how to jump through a hoop and a monkey to type, give me grape. I'll make your stupid tail mind me. And you do that whole speech, and, and then you threaten to cut their legs off. I've heard stories of people that do that, all right? Like the extreme things you said, well, look, any parent in the room knows that you've missed it once or twice with your kids. How powerful is it that you show the fruit that you've seen the Son of God and the Son of God seen you when you sit down and say, hey, I want you to know that what I said was wrong, and I'm sorry. Who put that on. That's called humility. And that's what Zacchaeus owned in this moment. I'm putting on humility because Jesus is in my house. It's amazing that saying you're sorry is a hard thing to do because you think you've got a right to be offended. I don't have a right. I lay down my rights and increase my responsibility. Now, there wasn't much that I gave up to come to Christ. I'll hear people say that. I gave up everything for Jesus. Oh, really? Yeah. Educate me. Oh, more money? He owns the cattle in a thousand hills. Tell me what you gave up that he didn't already own. I gave up nothing and received everything. It's the scandalous thing about grace. Is Zacchaeus became more wealthy having left his possessions and given them back because now he had what he could have never purchased before, being seen by the king and having a relationship with him. This is that that Jesus is talking about. Nobody else would have given Zacchaeus the time of day. Can I tell you, there were people that never gave me the time of day. And there will be people that think that you are something when you know you're really nothing without him. Our goal in life is pretty simple. Push through some crowds, climb the tree, and let him live in the house. And the house isn't a structure. The house is this temple. He lives in this house. That means if there's something in your house that's not right, I promise you Jesus will place a finger on it through the power of the Holy Spirit and say, this doesn't belong here anymore. And you're like, well, I don't know what that's, I don't know what that is. But look, as you, as you're first, when you first become a Christian, it's pretty easy. Because you're so lost, it's like you're trying to figure, you don't have to figure it out. It's like, oh, don't need to, Who? I feel convicted about that. Mm, probably not. And then it's like, once you get good at that one thing, it's like he picks you up and places you in another thing. It's like, now I need you to work on this. Like, man. Because when he's living in a house, it's always something that you can be more like him with. Look, I know there are things, like, the things I struggle with at 26 years of being a follower of Jesus Christ are not the same things I struggle with in the beginning. But there's still a struggle that I need to surrender because he's in my house. And I can't, I can't act like it's not there. It's the crazy thing about Jesus. He sees everything. Right? I can hide this junk from everybody else, but he sees it all. 
I can't, I can't have a terrible attitude and treat people wrong. And then I'm like, Lord, I'm here for prayer. And he's like, hey, don't come talking to me like that when you done talked all stupid to everybody else. Now, I know the Lord probably will never talk to you that way. But he has no issue talking to me like that. I feel like he's called me several times foolish, even dumb. I don't need you to agree. That's my mother-in-law right there. She's, she said, <laughs> she was, <laughs> she was <laughs> I said, so he's called me dumb. She's like, yep. <laughs> I'm like, hang on a minute. <laughs> you know what they say behind every successful man, there's a surprise mother-in-law. So there's, there is, <laughs> you like that, huh? <laughs> I think that, that what it is, is, is we get a chance to, like I'm telling you, the strongest testimony you have in your life is not that you climbed a tree, it's that he came to your house. I want you to feel it down in your bones today. The greatest thing is not the things you make videos about and tell them what all the world, is the strongest example that you have is the fact that you can say a whole lot of things, it's who he is in your house. And who he is in your house matters. It matches what he wants to do. Why would you push through a crowd and climb a tree to not let him have everything? He said, nothing is off limits. Listen to me today. If you want more, then you gotta lay down everything. If you wanna have a successful marriage, then I promise you it's possible if you will let him live in the house. Because you can't love each other the right way until you love God the right way until he's got the right spot. If you want to see your loved ones healed, you want to see them whole, you, you want to see your neighbors come to Jesus, you want to see that coach at the ballpark that gets on your last, Jesus wants to change his life. So instead of you laying hands on them, if you would be like, hey, I'm going to drag you through a crowd, throw you up a tree. And t- no. See, that's the thing is you can't make anybody love God and you can't make anybody live for God. But your fruit can be an example of Jesus coming to your house. I promise you, a tax collector being changed by the person of Jesus Christ ticked every religious person who thought he never deserved the opportunity. But it's the very reason that the Son of God came. I want you to stand with me because I have to close. We come off of these moments and just felt in my heart and in my spirit today to encourage you. I want to encourage you today. Every single one of you under the sound of my voice. Press through. Press through. Don't stop. Shy of the breakthrough that God has for you. There was a breakthrough for Zacchaeus that day, and he did not stop shy of it. He pressed through. The crowd was there to prevent him, just like the crowd is here to prevent you. Press through, then climb that tree. Take this stance. If it's left up to me, God, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get to you. Because I can tell you, it's a lot better in our life if we will take that step towards him for us to wait till tragedy hits to then become desperate. If left up to me, I'll do whatever it takes and then walk this life out. When he comes to your house, it'll be easy for everyone to see it. Like, well, what is it about you that's different? You can't be like, well, I push people and climb trees. No, Jesus lives in my house. Jesus lives in my house. And whenever you meet him, whenever he sees you and you see him clearly and he comes to your house, it changes everything about you. It's obvious to the people around you first. It's obvious. So today I'm asking you, are you willing to press through? Are you willing to climb a tree? And you willing to live this out? Because he's come to your house. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to take just a few minutes. I'm going to dismiss you. 
today I'm not asking you to move out from where you're standing. I'm not asking you to climb these steps because I have found it to be easier inside of a church building to say and commit to things that we don't honor when we walk out. The easiest place that you'll ever meet Jesus is in a crowd like this because we all want you to. But you're going to face a world that is not going to celebrate what you've decided. And I'm telling you, it doesn't matter because if God be for you, he's more than the world against you. And today, I want you to be encouraged. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but you know it's time for you to surrender your life, I'm asking you to press through the crowd to climb the tree and see him clearly because he's coming to your house. And today, all that has to happen from you isn't just the belief in your mind and in your heart. It's the confession with your mouth. And today, if you'd like to make that confession, I just want you to simply confess these words or repeat after me. Today, Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender my heart to you. I give you my life. Save me. Be my Lord and my Savior. Make me new. In Jesus' name. If you made that confession today, you are a part of the family of God now. You've pressed through that crowd. You've climbed the tree. Now, let it be evident that he lives in your house for real. And I think it's a reminder to the rest of the church. Is it obvious that Jesus has come to your house? That's the question you have to answer. I don't have to answer that. I got to answer for my house. Does he live in my house? And it starts with me. Daddy, listen to me. The Lord needs to live in you before you expect it of everybody else. If you want to change your family, you want to change it, no matter what age you are, you can. this is something that no age is a limit to this. You have an opportunity for Jesus to live in your heart and in your life and it to be obvious. It'll change you for his glory and his honor.